Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm James, and with me is Chesto. Hello all. And Mal. G'day. This week, we're looking at what could be the first glimpse of the new version of Australia's best seller. We'll also talk about some of this week's entries in the Cars Guide garage, and we'll catch up with the world's most daring freedom fighter in this week's Muskwatch. So stay with us. But first of all, we've had some feedback, which is great. And last time around, we were speaking about the Nissan Z, the much uh, anticipated 400Z uh, for Nissan and a new GTR. So Omar Monel came at us with a, a manifesto, or at least it's a, it's a list of demands. And he ended with this, but for context, I'll put it up the top. He says, yes, I'm in the US. So some of the models that he talks about um, are pertinent to the US market, maybe not so much elsewhere. He agrees with us that Nissan needs something lower than the new Z. He agrees that the IDX concepts would be perfect, those beautiful concept cars that Nissan did a few years ago. He also would call it Sylvia, and he says it should be a two-litre manual rear-wheel drive and lightweight. So basically that's a 180SX, 200SX, Sylvia. He agrees that Nissan needs that, and it would be very timely. He says the 400ZX or 400Z is supposed to have the Infiniti Q50, Q60 engine, which is that three-litre V6, um, VR30 TT. And the Infiniti Red Sport is at 400 horsepower out of the box, so that's just under 300 kilowatts. Um, So you could have um, a Nissan uh, Nismo edition because it's very tunable. So you could be up to 450 horsepower, like 335 kilowatts in no time. So I think he's right. That that would be the perfect engine, and that's the the rumour, I think. Yeah. But it will, that car will live and die, I reckon, by what they do to the chassis. If it's just an engine in the old yeah. chassis that's been tweaked a little bit, it's yeah. not going to be a fabulous drive. But if they put yeah. a lot of work into how it actually steers, then it could be a thing of absolute beauty. And they've yeah. got a, a great example of, of exactly what Chesto is concerned about in the Q50 Red Sport, in that it is a great engine, but it's never yeah. really had the chassis to support it. Yeah, um, yes. It's, it's still been yes. a bit more of a luxury car than that right performance machine. But my True. hopes are high. I'm, I'm so excited about that car. I've said this before. My first ever car was a 260Z. So if that thing is wow. a... Uh, if that wow, thing is you a, set, a you weapon, set the I'll be bar in the high with your first car. That's fantastic. Yeah. They bought it for five grand, rode it off like every other P plater has before me. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now they're worth about 40. So anyway... You're kidding. That one got away I, from I me. understand it wasn't Chesto's fault, though, in Chesto's No, it was team. not. No, someone okay. hit me, actually. But, uh, now, don't tell me it, it was in order. No, God, no. Ah, and it was the, it was the, two, the two seater, not the two plus two. The plus two plus two, two ruined the shape. Oh, up wow. What a shame that it came to an untimely end. It but did. Omar isn't finished. He, he wants a Pulsar GTIR to come back using yeah. the uh, Versa, Versa Note body, which is a hatch, um, and a two litre turbo all wheel drive. Fantastic. All power to him. Now, for Infinity, this is obviously relevant because he's in the States. Infinity is not a goer here in Australia anymore. But he wants the concept Roadster, which I think was called the Prototype 10. I did a bit of digging. It looks amazing. For people on YouTube, we'll have an image of that um, up for you to have a look at. With the Leaf Electric powertrain as a flagship, loaded with tech and touchscreens, and the cars need a way better interior anyway. So he sees that as a bit of an icebreaker. And he loves the new steering wheels from Nissan. They're kind of retro, and he cites the Sentra. And I found an image of it, and again, people on YouTube be able to have a look at it. And he's right; it does look like an old school, um, recognisably Nissan steering wheel. Yeah, so, awesome. some interesting observations in Omar's uh, manifesto. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Omar. On the same um, track, Neza said Nissan should also bring back the fair lady name. Um, he says uh, something about smacking fools on the track with my fair lady tickles my funny bone. <laughs> And then he, then he came back with a follow-up comment to his own comment and said, scratch that and any other genius ideas I've ever had. All humanity <laughs> needs is the Alfa Romeo Giulia GTAM. We've peaked, boys. That's what yeah. he says. So he's, he thinks that's as good as it's going to get. So yeah. that's it's in two comments, we've seen people suggesting the return of the official return of Sylvia and Fair Lady. Correct. And like... You know, the reason we never got Sylvia and Fair Lady really in Australia or the US is because, you know, Nissan presumed it was a little bit sooky to, to yeah. name them, uh, yeah. you know, such in, in our markets. But language, now, Language. 
we all know them. We all know, we all know the backstory. The time yeah. is now to give us the proper name. So, can I uh, side topic for just a moment? Don't these conversations just make you long for the good old days of the Japanese auto industry? So many great cars from that era. I know. You know? I know. And, and, and look, just the nineties we're looking for. You know, yeah. it's not necessarily the sixties. No, um, that's we'll right. get we'll get to that soon enough because there's some commentary very much in that vein. But uh, the evocatively named R Soul uh, says, you know, with the biggest financial crash since the 1930s. Due to a massive public health crisis, I wouldn't expect to see any newness in sports cars anytime soon, um, seeing as they weren't doing all that well prior to all this malarkey, uh, to use his words. So it's an interesting point. That is a great point. But you would have thought that uh, when Volkswagen had its trouble a couple of years ago, that uh, uh, the, the likes of the Bugatti Chiron would be the first to fall. And guess what? We've got a Bugatti Chiron. Yes, that's, that's true. The niche that's of true. all niches. And all, yeah, all, I'm, all I'm reading at the moment, too, is that they're just waiting to cut the ribbon on the 400. The production on that would have started way before any of this malarkey. Good so, point. So, uh, mate, that, that will still cruise through, I'm sure. Well, yeah. I mean, our soul says that he wouldn't be surprised to see a few car manufacturers go belly up in the near future. Um, that's, you know, so, with that, I agree with him. Yeah, yeah. Now, John Schroeder calls out the GFC and the 2011 earthquake and tsunami in Japan, of course, which hit Japanese manufacturers hard. But he says we're right. It was Richard that made the point in the last podcast that Nissan had Carlos the Ghost um, gone, uh, operating in the background. So John agrees, creative bookkeeping with the management style of a god or guru that, yeah. you know, good, goodness knows what was going on in the background. He says, where's the money, Carlos? <laughs> you know, Carlos, baby, go, does a legal shuffle and runs home to mum. So yeah. it, um, it's not to be discounted as a factor. And he says it'd be good to see Nissan back with a performance-style Z car and reaffirm the Nissan brand instead of the endless generic clones of SUVs which are duplicated by Renault. Remember being in Japan when Nissan, Nismo, cult cars were all over the place. Mm. And that put me in mind of going up to Japan in, I want to say it was about 1991, and going to the Fuji, five, it was a 500-kilometre touring car race at Mount Fuji, the car park, Fuji Speedway, was uniformly R32 GTRs yeah, awesome. and 180 SXs. The whole place, that's what it was full of, yeah. those cars. So I totally take his point and agree. Yeah, me too. Nissan had, Nissan had something that it's lost um, and could, could easily regain. Yeah. Now, and hopefully, David hopefully, Bird, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, Hopefully they've learnt the lesson from the GFC where Nissan during the GFC scaled right back and we're still feeling repercussions of that, uh, yeah. whereas Mazda pushed ahead, invested heavily, and look at the Mazdas we've got now. So mm. hopefully they take a leaf out of Mazda's book and uh, don't do the same thing twice. It's all, it's all those cliches, isn't it? You know, who dares wins. You, you've got to take a risk um, and, yeah, yeah, we'll see. Gamble. This will be a, quite a, a telling time. Yeah. Um, David Burt says he's sorry, he apologises, but says the Nissan Toyota Halo models we featured last time are, all caps, ugly. Mm -hmm. um, with a multitude of angles and shapes, the Supra looks like it's been shunted up the rear by a 200 series on the M5 or the Monash. So uh, that's quite an interesting comment. Um, <laughs> he says, in many respects, the Toyota 86 is a much purer execution of a two-door sports car than these two plastic fantastics. Um, in a similar vein to the Datsun 240Z. So there's a lot of sentiment out there wanting that simplicity, yeah? Yeah. 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 I, I, I agree with him, JC, to be honest. I, I love the Supra. I don't think anybody's head over heels with the way that it looks, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it certainly drives very well. But I yeah. agree with the 86 was a really nicely styled car, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. And interestingly, you know, uh, Tetsuya Tata was the um, engineer in charge of both those programs the 86 and the Supra. So in terms of the way the cars were styled, there's a big difference there. So he obviously gave free reign to the people working in the, the broader team. That's right. All right Have we now, ever complained we, that the, uh, the GTR isn't beautiful, though? Like, you know, the R34 even is probably the most celebrated of all GTRs. Yeah. It ain't a beautiful car. It's no, it's not by any it's stretch. Ugly, it's bluff. Yeah. I've got to say, though, that that 50... Fiftieth anniversary Ital design version oh. of the GTR, I really like. I think yeah. it's an uh, amazing looking thing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it can be made to look beautiful. But I suppose yeah, you're right. Looks aren't everything. 
But when, when you see that car, JC, the Atal design, you, it's so clear what they've done. It's like they've just taken a giant iron and ironed yeah. out all the creases. And it's like, yeah. oh, okay, actually under all of yeah. that, it is quite a good looking car. It's well, a they've, logical they've direction just, for the GTR to take. Yeah. Well, they've just put it in the microwave on high for about 30 seconds. And all those hard <laughs> all those hard edges have just kind of softened off a bit. The plastics yeah, exactly. have returned to their original form. <laughs> <laughs> now, we shifting shifting subjects here. Previously, uh, we also talked about utes versus a van. Now, M4, uh, Matt, Matt Campbell, who was in the podcast last week, we discussed the prospect of comparing utes with one-box vans because mm -hmm. as a working vehicle, you know, which has the better utility. And Stewie GB thinks the ute versus van idea is brilliant. And for work, he has a Hilux for towing and generally, his words, not mine, looking flash, um, <laughs> and a high ace, and a high ace for the actual on-site work. He says the van's got it all over the ute for working out of, put a false floor for ladders, et cetera, underneath, 100%. and still have a shed load of space for everything else above. And he says, love your work. So um, that's what he Even better. JC, uh, you, if, if I was moving time, house, sorry, Mel, you go. I was just going to say, but at the same time, it's a whole heap of stuff you can fit in the infinite uh, height capacity of a ute that you mm. can't fit in a van. So well, it comes down yes, to the job you're the, doing. The load, height, the load height is quite generous in a high ace. <laughs> it's infinite. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but I, suppose, I suppose there's also the security of a one box that whatever is in it is in it. You're not risking anything falling off, yeah. flying off, all that kind of stuff as well. And the weather protection, JC, as well. Good Mate, point. I've said this before, but it, when I'm moving house, it's van over you any day of the week. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. 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 Too true. Well, look, Andre, I'm going to have a crack at this name and just watch me nail this. Andre Voggia, uh, he loves the van and, in fact, calls out the Mitsubishi Delica 4x4, which has been a big grey import favourite over a period of time in Australia. But... I did note that our, um, our friends at Go Auto a while ago noted that Mitsubishi Australia is studying the return of the current D5 version of the Delica. And mm -hmm. if you look um, for people on YouTube behind us, um, we've got some pics of that car. So uh, Mitsubishi Australia saying, yeah, yeah, we're studying, having a look at it, might add it into the mix. Mm -hmm. I and think it would take TG the Triton and the ASX to have a big... Uh big whack in their sales charts for the, the to, to push go on the Delica. That's my two cents. Yeah, Delica. So you're going the Delica, as in Silica, rather than Delica Silica? Uh, I think that's how the enthusiasts uh, pronounce it. It's a bit Delica. like the, the Nissan okay. Stagia wagon, you know. It has <laughs> Stagia. 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 Stagia, like we'd say. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hang on, I'm, I'm, it, it has enthusiasts? I'm stagia. <laughs> Test though, get with the That's program. Get with Just the, the about everything program. as enthusiasts. And always remember, Mel's never met a car he doesn't like. So there's also Actually, TG, TGV, the very fast train, has said, I prefer the SUV versions of the year. So he likes the Pajero Sport, Everest, Fortuna, over the respective Triton Ranger and Hilux. So if it comes down to a comparison in terms of what, what works best for him. That said, I really want the new 2020 Ford Explorer ST. Shame Ford won't make it in right-hand drive. I've raised my hand for just a moment. Yes. With the wonders of Google, I've dug up a, a Japanese ad, ah. and it, it is Dalika. Dalika. Da Fair enough. Okay. Da I will uh, adjust my pronunciation from this moment <laughs> forward. Dalika. Now, uh, our New Zealand correspondent, Wax333, says... Will we see the Nissan Titan in Australia and New Zealand? And that's been the $64,000 question for some time. Chesto, I think you've written some stuff recently, most recently, about the Titan. What's, what's your yeah. mail on that? It's, it's coming. Lock it in. Uh, well, look, it was coming before the corona craziness broke out. They yeah. were investigating. They're so keen on having that car in Australia. They were investigating right-hand drive factory production. If they can't get that, they were hedging their bets by investigating right-hand drive conversions in Australia because yes. of the success of Ram and others. So they yes. were champing at the bit for that vehicle. It was, it was, a, it was a lock. What's happened since coronavirus has come out and the havoc that's wreaked on car company finances, I don't know. But certainly a month ago, it was, it was a certainty. And can I just add, they, they weren't simply just pondering it. They were actively pursuing this car for yeah. a, a, at least a few years before all this. So yeah solid, solid uh, intentions yeah. to bring the car here. But, of course, there are now right. question marks over everything, well, so fingers crossed. All right. 
Well, Wax also says that Nissan should uh, renew the Primera based on the P11, which was a 1995 to 2002 car. But the reason might be that um, that car was assembled in Weary in the southern part of Auckland in New Zealand uh, for some really? time. He says the styling would be cool uh, to see, maybe a skyline for the masses. Yeah. And um, he also asked if there are any details on the new Subaru Lavorg, 1.8 litre turbo and power outputs in our own Tom White did do a story for us um, on that. Um, and he said they all knew that they're calling it Lean Burn, 1.8 litre, uh, four-cylinder boxer. Um, nothing's confirmed, but he's saying maximum outputs are 147 kilowatts, 294 newton metres, um, with the ladder available quite low down because it's a turbo. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. Those things need to be uh, confirmed over time. Mm -hmm. Now, under the subject of general commentary, uh, <laughs> Thunder 250 came in with first viewer, which is a you know a, an online uh, must do. Then he said something I'd love to see are more cars similar to Imprezas and Evos of the 90s. There's just this nostalgia, yeah, for, absolutely, for cars of the 90s and early 2000s that have small capacity four cylinder engines, capable of pushing huge power with a few modifications, but still affordable for most people. Similar to the current 86 BIZ. So there are a lot of people out there that just want more of that. You know what we need to make that happen, though? We need rallying to take off again. You know, we've got Toyota with the, the GR yeah. efforts with yeah. the Yaris. Uh, yeah. the, the commenter before was asking for the return of the Pulsar GTIR. That yeah. car only existed for rallying. Rally car. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, WRX for rallying, Evo for rallying. Get behind yeah. rallying and the rest will follow. Now, yes. I, reckon, I reckon there's also an argument that the time is coming again for that just through circumstance. V8s are already on the out. V6s will be next. If you want a performance vehicle in the future, it likely will be a four-cylinder. And frankly, we, when you look at the uh, GR Yaris's output with its 1.63, you can see what's actually possible with those engines. I mean, I just think that time's coming again naturally, to be honest. Well, look, Teo Rayu made a good comment um, in response to Thunder 250. He said, I reckon Hyundai will bring all that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, when you think about i30N, Kona N, Elantra N, on it goes. I think it's a Veloster, you know, so... Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff may well come from Hyundai and, and a new source. And, and don't forget that uh, Toyota is going to GR everything from the you know, Corolla to the CHR to yeah. ar arguably the Yaris and Corolla Cross. So there's a lot of stuff, a lot of little performance cars coming. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, absolutely. I'm not sure now, we'll see it in the same vein as we did in the 90s with our no, the, homologation. Yeah. And, and the rallying point is a really good one now. Oh, yeah, correct. homologation drives that kind of innovation, doesn't it? Um, now, mm. our old mate Hammer Rock says... I don't mean to brag, but I've been practicing social distancing, that is, avoiding people, way before COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, NZ Sarge 1 says, we were talking about coffee in cars and coffee makers in cars, and uh, he says, Audi, he or she says, Audi has an optional coffee maker on some of its SUVs. And I did a bit of digging here, and it's actually called that, believe it or not, hand presso. It's the hand presso, <laughs> and for people on YouTube, there'll be some vision of it um, in the background. It's a little, you know, 12-volt powered unit that sits in your cup holder. You pour the water in around the top, put a little coffee bag on the top, screw the top on, give it a press, and it spits out an espresso that awesome. you can have on the road. And Audi does a bad diversion for, as an option accessory for some of their cars. Hopefully no one's doing it at 180 on the auto. <laughs> yeah, <though. laughs> that's right. I agree. Yeah, that's right. And look, finally, Barton is one, two, three, has a dilemma. He says, I have a dilemma, window tint or no tint. My new car has no factory tint, but I'm actually somewhat enjoying that, finding the visibility at night. Uh, superb. But anyone I've ever talked to has always gone directly for the tint. Am I the odd one out here? Should I be tinting? Good and I think it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as I'm aware, the benefits are that it, it cuts UV light. And that's for heat and fading or damage to the interior of the car. It, it can reduce glare and it helps the AC, gives it a bit of a leg up because you're getting less heat into the car. Mm -hmm. All I would say to Barton is one, two, three, is if he does it, don't do it yourself. The number of times yeah. you've seen that back window. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, we can save a lot of money. I'll just do it myself. It'll be great. And then it's an absolute horror show. Everyone's oh, seen it. Always starts with that famous question. 
Well, how hard could it be? <laughs> the answer is very hard. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I mean, so if you can remember of... covering your books at school, yeah, that's covering right. glass yeah, exactly is much books. harder. Well, I mean, part of it's aesthetic as well, I suppose, if you like yeah. that kind of brooding, darker look around the windows on your cars. But it seems as though there's a lot of upside to it. Can I now, add another detail? Uh, yeah. uh, it, once again, it comes down to the job you're doing with the car. But yeah. another key consideration is the comfort of any children on the back seat yeah you know you put baby in there they'll just cry they don't tell you oh the sun's in my eyes they just yes. cry yes uh and it's a good you know cover all and, and you're also protecting their skin you want you know if you, think, if you think about it we should be lathering up in sunscreen every time we go for a drive sure but if you've got a or you could just turn around tint, and it really help whack you. couldn't you just whack a pair of sunnies on on the on <laughs> kind of cut out the middle man i've tried that <laughs> <laughs> didn't go well no, no. didn't last long. All, all right well look thanks to everyone who came at us with all that feedback it was terrific thank you very much and we'll move on to our main subject area which is hilux and hilux 2021 um the vehicle of next year it's it's within reaching distance yes and Chester, you've researched and written a story for us during the week and fill us in on the latest what's what's been happening yeah, so look, we've covered this car a lot for obvious reasons. Best-selling car in Australia, always a perennial favourite, um, super important car for Toyota, and particularly for Toyota in Australia. So new ones coming, we know that. And last week we got our, or this week, we got our first peek at, at some Im images of that car, what it should look like. They were yep. released by a website called uh, Miele or Miele Motors, which is a vehicle wholesaler to Asia and Africa. Which and, does... and as I said earlier, uh, a maker of very high quality kitchen appliances. And now, what was was the other one? Vacuum cleaners. Vacuum cleaners. Vacuum That's cleaners. Right. But I yes. think this might be a separate arm to that guy. Okay. Okay. But uh, but anyway, it does add some credibility to these images. These are the guys that will be selling it in Asia and Africa. So the the presumption is that they would have had a pretty good look at this vehicle that's about to launch. And I guess the first and most important, I'm sure it's popped up in the background now. I actually think it looks really good. It gives the yeah. Hilux a kind of Tacoma styling at the front end. It adds a bit of toughness to it, which is never a bad thing. Yeah. Time. But it doesn't change the sort of overall dimensions or concept or anything. It's just if you're giving a vehicle a tickle, it's a really good way to do it. Sure. Looking at the photos, it there doesn't seem to be any sheet metal changes. All we're no. looking at is a new grille, front fascia, and uh, headlights. Yeah, so, so new, uh, new LED headlights at the front and at the rear, new 17 and 18 uh, alloy wheel choices, new DRLs mm. design, and a new mm. front end. I mean, that's basically the Hollis Bolus. Right. The, the wheels in the photo, though, the, like the, the renderings we've, we've seen show the track widened by at least three or four inches. That's not going to happen. <laughs> exactly. No. Unless, unless they actually give us, you know, the, the Hilux Raptor we've all been but, wanting. Correct. Uh, but just visualise oh. it with the standard track, just with that nose and that's I don't know products. about you guys, but I've spoken to numerous, um, you know, car designers and they always use those earlier renderings as a way to push the envelope. But yeah. they'll, they'll teach the dog to jump this high and then hope that they get to this high. I'll put these massive rims on yeah, and then right. we'll get the size we want. And I'll widen the yeah. track that much and maybe we'll get what we're actually yeah. after. L look and like really, they're compromising. This, this only represents the mid-cycle facelift for the highlights. Yeah. You know, yeah, we've been right. seeing this highlights for a fair few more years yet. Correct. Uh, and this is a, is a decent update to it, but it'll be the same car from, you know, the radiator support panel backwards. Which but, leads the, to the question, Chesto, in terms of what's going to be under the bonnet. Yes. So, while well, the exterior changes are not massive, but significant in the way they style the car. Far more significant is some of the other tickling that's been going on. I'll start in the cabin. You'll finally yeah. get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in a Hilux, which is uh, frankly unbelievable that it's taken this long to arrive, but it, yep. will, it will arrive with this one. And under yep. the bonnet, it's the same engine, but it's been fiddled, and we're expecting the outputs to increase by about 20 kilowatts and 20 newton metres. Now, I know they don't sound like huge numbers, but the idea there is that we'll put it just about on par with the Ford Ranger, which is its biggest okay. rival. Not the yep. 500 newton metre engine, the... the, the, the uh, larger but lower capacity engine um yeah. so yeah so it should be roughly 150 kilowatts 470 newton meters which is a, a, enough grunt now the bad news we, we were expecting it to arrive in australia in july but the factory where it and the fortuna 
are both being produced is currently still closed um, due to oh, corona craziness. So okay. the, pro- the production date has reportedly been pushed back to May 9, which is a month later, which, yep. which if all goes according to plan, should push its arrival in Australia by a month. But again, yep. you know, so much of that is how long's a piece of string at the moment. It's just a plan to reopen. It hasn't actually done it yet. So okay. it will be delayed, but it will be here this year, barring, you know, some unforeseen disaster. And yes, Toyota will be calling it the 2021, even though it will arrive this year. It's yes, a 2021 exactly. model year car. Yeah, okay. Correct. Correct. Um, so that's about a wrap. We don't know, unfortunately, we don't know pricing and spec yet, but it's a hugely competitive space. Don't expect the pricing to increase by too much, uh, if at all. Uh, and yeah, look, expect it from around August with some pretty critical updates. Mr. Yes, Flynn, you have a question. Oh, thank you, Mr. Cleary. Uh, can I just point out, I can remember the first time we clapped eyes on the most recent Land Cruiser 200 series update, and yep. it came to us via similar renderings that what we're seeing here with the, the Hilux, and I was really worried. I thought they'd broken the Land Cruiser, and it wasn't a particularly good-looking car before that, uh, but now I think the, the, the current 200 looks pretty good. Yeah. Now, All right. the, the the, the reason why I'm saying this is that looking at these renderings now and to actually think, wow, that looks good, bodes well for the real thing. I Even see. though I'm criticising the track we're seeing in the images. But, uh, All right. Yeah. So the last, the Land Bring Cruiser 200, it needed to age for you. It needed to have a bit of time in market and it came uh, good as it were. No, it, I think it was merely just seeing it in the flesh. Okay. Uh, and, yeah. you know, this comes... You know, this, this also highlights why manufacturers hate leaked images. They want us to show the car in the you know, in the ideal light and, and the, the realistic uh, way that we will see them on the road. Yeah, right. uh, And so some just, obscure rendering doesn't necessarily do that. So just to clarify, the first Land Cruiser 200 you saw, it wasn't broken. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was on the back of a tow truck. It, yeah, it was right. the right. <laughs> when I saw it in the flesh, I thought, hmm, it's not broken. There you go. Okay. You oh, I get you. All right. Very good. The, well, um, now... Yeah, go, go on, Chester. Oh, sorry. I was just going to uh, just say I was speaking to someone at, at Toyota about that very issue the other day, and they were saying the curse of having – and it's actually, it's a feeling shared by, by uh, Land Rover and the Defender. The curse of having a kind of iconic vehicle in the lineup is that every time you launch a new one, the first reaction is, well, you've ruined it. And then as right. soon, once that gets into market for a while, they get used to it. That yes. becomes a new iconic status. Then you launch another one, and they say, yes. well, you've ruined the one that we thought you originally ruined. So, yes. you know, it's just one of those circles. One exception to that, though, is the 996 Porsche. I don't think anyone thinks the, the no, broken was... egg headlights on the 996 Porsche look good even today. Even and market, market values would very much reflect that now. <laughs> 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 there are some bargains to be had out there in 996, 911s, that's for sure. Mm. Correct. All right, now, we're going to move to our own garage, and sadly, no 911s in there during this week, but... Uh, Mel, I'm going to start off with you, and this is a car that Chesto uh, nominated as his drive or car in the garage just a little while ago. We want to get your take on it this time, though. Yeah, sure. So uh, it was my turn to drive the Kodiak RS, the Skoda Kodiak RS, which uh, I understand Chesto discussed at length in uh, episode 128, which is hey, two weeks ago. There you go. Yep. Uh, and I found it, you know, looking... The, the notion of a performance SUV, performance SUV still sort of sounds like a bit of an, an oxymoron to me. Mm-hmm. But I think the application of the Skoda RS formula uh, bodes really well for the Kodiak, which is a seven-seater, but it's not a very big SUV. It's okay. still only, you know, like an elongated Mazda CX-5. Uh, it's still quite narrow, it's still quite low, and therefore it's still quite manoeuvrable. And the Skoda RS formula isn't about massive performance. It's about a bit quicker and a bit more lively and a bit exciting. Um, and I think it works really well. It, it's yeah. given this car that's really cleverly designed. You know, we've always loved the Kodiak's uh, f- near infinite uh, family-focused details from, the you know, the little things that pop out yeah. from the doors to stop mm, the stuff Very the thoughtful. Paint. Yeah, very you thoughtful. Know, yeah. The, the classic Skoda rubbish bin in the, the door. Um <laughs> You know, the storage space under the back, the fact that it has seven seats in such a small car. Um, plus, also, it's it, like at RS point, it's got every feature you can think of, really. Yep. Uh, yes, it's not a particularly cheap Skoda in that it, it uh, lists at just under $66,000. Um, but 
you know, the, the Alcantara on the seats is just, it's just full of nice little details that mm. sort of lift it beyond typical family hauler and give you that that yes. feeling of, well, I've treated myself here and it's it's something pleasant to go into every day. Very and, good. And it's not particularly fast. Chesto, is the 0-100 uh, claimed seven seconds, I think, from the Yeah, a, about that. Yeah, that's right. So it's at least half a second behind, so Golf GTI. And actually not um, that much faster than the the, uh, the Skoda below it. I think it's a second quicker to 100 to the to the model below it, yeah. Right, but, but I think... The whole package works quite well. Um, mm. um, you know, it is a it's a it's a twin turbo diesel, isn't it? Chisto, the, it is, the mate, yep. turbo for yeah. So, you know, they've hooked up the power to one hundred and seventy six kilowatts. Um, the idea of a diesel performance car still, yeah. But mm. I think they've embraced mm. what made the first Audi SQ five work so well, and even the SQ seven work so well, but in a yes. a much cheaper, smaller package. You know, yes. they've got the, the accentuated exhaust noise, but that also disguises the fact that it's a diesel under the bonnet. Yeah. Yeah. So I think as a, as a daily family proposition, it's, it's a really nice package, and it's also a unique package for now in the market. The, uh, the point I made a couple of weeks ago, Mal, that I, I think you, you agree with is that I, I felt like if they'd pushed that RS envelope too far, they would have ruined it. I think the fact mm. that, it's, that it is quite understated as a performance car, so much so that you can still easily use it as a daily runabout for the family, which is its core duty, is Definitely. actually the genius of what they've done there. Definitely. You know, there's no low-hanging body bits. No, um, exactly. That will, you know, be a pain in the neck to go in and out of bumper, uh, driveways and speed humps and all that sort of stuff. Mate, you've uh, always got to watch have... those uh, low-hanging body bits. That's, uh, <laughs> they, can, oh, they can get you in a lot of trouble. That's why I don't ride bicycles anymore, Jackson. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, anyway, mate, the, the well, only thing I'd can I just say one last thing on that Cody on the on Skoda, which I think is so clever. Those little pop out door bits. I remember being on the launch of that car, and I spoke to one of the engineers. I was like, "Oh my god, so how did you make this happen? You know, it's so clever. What sort of amazing engineering has gone into this?" And he just gave me this look and went, "Mate, it's just a spring. It opens when you open it, just springs out. When you close it, it springs back in." I was like, also, "It's just it's so not the simple. first to think of it. No, yeah. first but, to think of it either. I think the previous generation Focus had it." But, uh, but I don't think everyone, Australian models ever got it. Why does oh, everyone totally. have it? It's such an and easy, it say, great thing. You know, the other workaround is that, you know, people stick those stupid rubber things on them with reflectors on them. It makes yeah, your yeah, car yeah. look stupid. That's right. Whereas yeah. these ones, when the door's shut, it doesn't exist. But when it opens, yeah. it's protected. And you such don't have to worry about it. It's destroying your car. You don't have to worry about the, 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 the wall in the garage or the cars parked next to you. Uh, yeah. uh, You've installed a set on the EH box. Behind you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've just uh, got a couple of springs out, out of some uh, happening on, on like your prime joint. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll demonstrate the next <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good. Now, thank you very much. Now, we'll move on to you, Chesto, and you've been in a different uh, part of the market. Fill us in on your ride from the from this. Correct. Uh, I'm a man of the people, as you know, so I'm in something far more affordable: the uh, Hyundai Venue Active. Uh, which is really interesting because it is basically Hyundai's new take on cheap and cheerful. It's the it's the most affordable model in their range. It replaces the Accent, which I think towards the end of its days you could get for about fifteen grand drive away. You know, and they were selling them hand over fist, but they weren't making any money on that car. So the idea was to bring something in at a slightly higher price point that they could actually turn a profit on, even if they yep. sold less of them, which I think is where where they'll go to with the venue. Now, Mal, Mal has his hand up, Chester. Sorry, Sorry. he's just urgent hand in the air. I, I was just wanted to add that I think Australia is still getting their head around the fact that Hyundai's added the Kona a couple of years ago as their baby SUV, and now yeah. we've got the Venue as well. It's and you the think, baby, baby. But the Kona's already pretty small, but the Venue is actually marginally smaller again than the Kona. That's right. And it just, it, it also feels it, to sit in and to drive like the Kona's little brother, mm. you know, like, so it mm. does, it, it certainly fills a role there. Now, the, the Active is the second uh, in the trim level, starts with Go, steps up to Active. It's about 24, 25 grand, uh, 1.6 litre petrol engine, six speed, six speed automatic. Uh, and look, it does what it says on the box. It's not the most invigorating drive experience I've ever had, but it is, uh, it, it's comfortable, it's quiet. That, that little engine is surprisingly perky for a car of that size, although you do have to wring its neck a little bit to get the performance out of it. Um, but perhaps most importantly, it has a nice little eight-inch screen in the middle, Apple CarPlay yeah, right. sets up. It's a great – it is like the perfect P-plate car. And 
Can I add another thought? You may. Yes, Mel. Go that ahead, was not Mel. my door shutting in the background. No, um, that was my door shutting in the background. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, the, the notion of a SUV replacing a small hatch might sound a bit funny to some people, but I think, Chester, you'll probably agree that you know the higher uh, ride height, etc., is great for access, and also yeah. you don't. Once again, you don't have to worry about speed humps or the dividers in car parks. That's right. Uh, it's just an easier car to live with without and, actually being bigger. It's a little bit taller, but it's really no bigger. And I like to think that by now we've all reframed our idea of what what an SUV is. You know, as punters out there, because. This one is really an SUV in the looser sense of the term. You're right, Mal. It's a little bit higher. It's got a higher hip entry point. It's a bit easier to load stuff into the back. But it, it really, there almost needs to be a whole other term. It's it's kind of like a high, it's a high riding hatch, isn't it, really? Mm, yeah. but, but but it does yeah. it does tweak those little elements that makes it just a little bit easier to live with. But if they well, called it, it a high riding it, hatch, no one would buy it. Like that's right. Yeah, ex- exactly. Yeah. And exactly. I mean, you you called it Chesto. It's a great P plate car. It is the start of the staircase. It's the first tread on the on the staircase for Hyundai, Sorry. isn't it? And it's changing people's attitudes in what a first new car might be. And yeah. you think about Toyota with the Yaris Cross. You know, they're they're seeing that SUVs are the way of the future. We need an entry level car in that that's same right. configuration. So it's an important one. And off topic for a moment, but the Yaris Cross is going to be a stroke of absolute genius because not only is it an entry-level SUV, but it'll also be an entry-level hybrid. And we've seen the way the yeah. market's shifting in Australia. You bet. It, I, I, point. I said this before, but I, I think that car's all sorts of gold for Toyota. I really do. Great point. Yeah. Prius C evidently came a bit early in the, the, the hybrid world um, and yeah. also like Jazz Hybrid. I think it was actually yeah. the cheapest for a while. Uh, yeah, it was right. clearly yeah. ahead of its time. Yeah, we're we're now ready for it. I think, but but um, also just the Prius is such a it's just a big fat bottle of uncool, isn't it? You know, like no, <laughs> no, right. nobody, you know. No, no, I, I, yeah, anyway, I won't get too far unless I get to <laughs> some sort of price. Some people find it cool. Lots of other people don't find it cool. But yeah, evidently, hey. lots of other people don't want to be seen to be driving a hybrid all the time, but want to be able to say it's a hybrid. Yeah, that's a well, conversation. Look, uh, the other thing is, over time, Prius as a nameplate picked up a bit of baggage, you know, that, yeah. that you, you had a certain message to send politically when you were in a Prius, and yeah. something like a Yaris or a Corolla has none of that. No, um, so it's a different proposition. Now, I'll just follow on. Oh, Mel, go ahead. <laughs> sorry. I was just going to ask, uh, back to the venue, sorry, uh, what, uh, what the backseat report had been thus far from your... Uh, Four-legged companion. Uh, well, look, my as you know, my four-legged. We have a little corgi, of course. If, we, if you follow any of my long-term reviews, you'll have met her many times. Her, her legs are roughly, I'm going to say, four centimeters each. So no, <laughs> <laughs> no, compl- no complaints about leg room for days. She's On a leg low rider. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a low rider. Very good, mate. Actually, to be honest with you, we we have used it. Um, some of its practicality perks to date, you know, we, you know, we're all in ISO. There's been plenty of trips to Bunnings and, and Flower Power to try and, you know, get some home projects done. And again, it, you know, it, it is surprisingly practical. If you're a bit clever in the way you pack it um, and you fold down the seats or you pack up the back seat, you'd be surprised at how much, how many people or how much stuff you can squeeze into a car the size of the venue. You might be shocked. Yep. All right. I'll, I'll follow on. With uh, the car I've been driving this week is Jaguar E Pace. It's the checkered flag edition, P250, so it's all wheel drive. Um, bit over nearly $64,000 before you put it on the road. Uh, two litre turbo, nine speed auto, um, and it's not, you know, 183 kilowatts, which, which isn't too shabby. 363 newton meters developed very low, 1250 RPM is, is where that'll start to kick in. I had the pluses down as. It's photon red, uh, and I don't know if you guys have seen that colour. It's the most amazing kind of uh, pulsing orangey red colour. Um, like a lipstick really, red? The number of people that commented on it, you, you, if I had a dollar for each of them, I'd have a round of drinks. You know, it's been really, uh, really interesting. Great front seats. Um, I noticed also one little quirk is the centre storage box between the front seats. You flip the lid like it's armrest, they're also a storage box. That space goes in under the cup holders further up in the console. So you've got like this underground layer uh, beneath the cup holders for extra stuff. So it's got quite a lot of space in there. Sounds like now, a perfect place to lose things. 
<laughs> yeah, but you could see it that way, or you could see it as an opportunity for extra storage. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, good, really good rear room has a huge glass kind of sunroof as part of the spec, and it's nicely finished. Red contrast stitching on some leather and all of that. What I had in the the um, the negative column was that it was quick but not really urgent. You know, you you wanted a, probably a little bit more pickup. The brakes felt a little bit um, unrefined. They tend to grab. You have to really squeeze the pedal to get a, a refined kind of slowing or stopping. The road feel wasn't exactly where you'd like it to be through the steering either. And most of all, the gear shift paddles on the steering wheel are plastic and so obviously plastic. They've been, you know, cast or extruded and there's a big seam down the edge of them. And there's something you, you really feel if you want to change the gears and they feel bad. Yeah. So uh, for me, that's that's a negative, but um, an interesting car. Yeah, that's really when, interesting because I think the um, didn't the first F Type have uh, yeah. really ordinary paddle shifters and not, so much they that. that haven't yeah. they? They have. Yeah. So and why was, haven't they applied that logic across the range? I don't know. It's a pertinent question mm. because it is just one of those touch points where you want it to feel good. Because if you're choosing to change the ratios yourself. Um, you have been interested in driving or whatever, and just to have that mm. uh, cheap feeling plastic under your fingers is not great. It's part of that yeah. handshake, isn't it? That handshake. Yep. In, in your the first handshake is the steering wheel yeah. and everything that goes with it. Yeah. But for me, I think that um, look, it's not a huge amount. That's not, in the world of cars, it's not a huge amount of money. But for me, it's a, a sizable amount, sixty grand. I, yep. I want every, I want everything to be to feel nice. I want it to work. You know. Absolutely. And it, and it takes me back to your Skoda, Mal. You know, I just don't think that's a mistake they make. They, everything in that car feels like it should feel, you know, like you want it to yep. feel at that price point. So, yeah, and the same like applies a, for a Fabia for under 20 yeah. or around 20. So, so um, maybe it sounds like we're nitpicking, but, but it, that's something you notice every day in a car. You know, you do want those things to be perfect. Most definitely. Mm. Yep. All right. Well, speaking of being perfect, it's time for Musk Watch. Musk Watch. <laughs> okay all right here we go so the verge according to the verge elon musk called shelter in place orders in the san francisco bay area uh, and throughout the u.s fascist uh, he says it's stripping people of their freedom and on it he was on a tesla earnings call on oh. wednesday so he was answering some analyst questions about liquidity during the coronavirus uh, and the effect of Alameda County's extension of stay-at-home orders, which means the Fremont plant stays shut for another month. So he was obviously peeved about all this, and he's called it fascist. Um, he echoed Donald Trump's so eerily on Wednesday night. He put an all-caps tweet out saying, free America now. So oh. he's gone full political on the whole thing. He says, quote him, the expansion of shelter in place, or as we call it, forcibly imprisoning people in their homes against all their constitutional rights is, in my opinion, breaking people's freedoms in ways that are horrible and wrong and not why people came to America and built this country. What the fuck? That's what he put in uh, his uh, statement. If somebody wants to stay in the house, that's great. They should be allowed to stay in the house, blah, 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 blah. It just goes on and on. Um, so it's Really, it's the way you treat this whole coronavirus thing. Is it a political issue? Is it a financial issue? Or is it a health issue? And I've got to say that in Australia, it seems to have been treated very much as a health issue. And from what you see and read in the media from the states, it is on the fringes, at least, very much a political issue, which has these financial overtones. You know, we, we reserve the right to do whatever we want to do. Um, and look, Twitter went into a tornado. It just went into this firestorm of feedback, um, claims and counterclaims um, on the relative merits of a lockdown. Some people saying it makes no difference at all, including the dear leader, I might add. Um, Elon's desire for the Fremont factory to open so he can make a big payday, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, then he tweeted random stats and opinion pieces about, you know, trying to justify his position on the whole thing. And someone came out and said, look, it's your fault for not colonising Mars early enough. Um, which I thought was a which was a good comeback, but Paul Bennett said on Twitter, "Ewan needs a nap. 
and he came up with a book cover for kids and it's it's from Paperback Paradise, which is something I subscribe to on Instagram, which is the retitling of classic paperbacks. I'd recommend it. And it's a child's Keep guide on. to on, a child's guide to online political discussion. Everyone I don't like is Hitler. So, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I'll jump in for just one sec. Let me first apologise for the change in audio. I've, uh, I've I've just gone back onto mains power for a moment. Yep. But I, I tell you, nobody can read the room like Elon Musk. He, he would have been making those statements on just about the same day that America's death toll surpassed that of Vietnam, and he's yes. and he's complaining about stay at home orders. I just he has this inability to read a room. It's incredible. Well, it, it, it speaks to his priorities, I suspect. You know, he yeah. wants the factories to be open. He wants people to be working because I think he sees, just my, my personal opinion, he sees the world through the lens of money um, and he, he wants people to be able to work. He wants liquidity in the economy. Um, and if people have to suffer um, around the edges of that, so be it. Incredible. And also, Hebe, you know, like all these things that they're worried about, ending are not light switches they're not a matter of turning them off and on if True. if these big organizations fail they're not coming back or no. certainly not in the way we know them for a long time you know That's car true. manufacturing plants is such a detailed uh you know uh, whole bunch of things that contribute to putting a car together that need yeah. to be synchronized perfectly too uh, true. And I do not mean to defend him one bit, but that's, uh -huh. that's the sort of thing he's thinking of. Plus, no doubt, a big payday, which we're about to well, hear about, I think. I think the, the duality of the whole thing is summed up in two tweets. Robert Oliva said, I still believe Musk's Twitter has been hacked. It is impossible that Elon Musk is that stupid and political. If it is the real Musk, I will lose all respect for him. Okay. And then the very next tweet, Daryl Gray, the first member of the billionaire club to speak the truth. Elon Musk for president. We need more people to stand up and speak about the truth of what's happening. So there it is in, in two consecutive tweets, the, yeah. the polar opposites on that whole uh, discussion in the US at the moment. Happily, he doesn't qualify for uh, a presidential run, I think, because he was born in South Africa. So he was born like, and grew up in Canada. Exactly. So now, the, so the next bit is from Inc.com. Elon Musk is closing in on a $600 million payday. He could net $55 billion when it's all said and done. Now, this is about the uh, remuneration agreement. He's, he had signed off with the board of Tesla. So Musk is already one of the richest people in the world. He's soon about to add boatloads of cash to his coffers with the help of a soaring Tesla stock. He could net $600, $600 million in new stock um, as part of a compensation package. There are 12 components which ultimately add up to $55 billion. Now, what he's got to do is keep the market capitalization above $100 billion for Tesla on a trailing six-month period. So if you can do that, he gets more than uh, 1.69 million Tesla shares in the company. Now, and the timing, it, it just couldn't be worse. Here he yeah. is getting many, many, many millions of dollars as a lot of Tesla, um, you know, workers are at home twiddling their thumbs and, and it's just not a great look. But anyway, that's what he's staring down the barrel of. JC, i got to say, uh, I, this, uh, going against what I said a moment ago, he probably deserves it. So much of Tesla for so long has yeah. been Elon Musk. Is him. They, they it's him. Be You're the right. They are today if it wasn't for him. So, yep. you know, he probably deserves the conversation. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Now, we'll, we'll also get to the third bit in our Musk watch, watch today. He's changed his Twitter profile handle to Deus Ex, which, of course, means God of um, in Latin. Um, and in 20, I went back and in 2018, he asked Twitter followers to nominate which games they'd like to see in Teslas as Easter eggs, right? So one of them, Deus Ex, is a role-playing game from around 2000, and it has this superhuman hero called J.C. Denton who's been given these powers via nanotechnology and on it goes. And the developers responded to Elon's tweet and said, look, that'd be great. So just recently, Elon's changed his Twitter profile pic to this central character, uh, JC Denton, because back in 2018, Mary on Twitter had said, oh my God, this guy looks exactly like you, meaning Elon. And he's heroic, chiseled, you know, he-man looking up at the stars. And Elon's come back with, Busted, you know, oh, the really cringy little exchange. 
<laughs> so others have uh, suggested, at, back in the day, suggested Pong and Frogger and Pac-Man, you know, yeah, yeah, Mario yeah. Kart and all that stuff. But then at the same time, I noticed there was a real thread of little um, uh, alternate messages coming through. Hefty Curves, Andy said, less production line injuries and a unionised workforce. That's what he'd like to see. And then MW Unicorn said, a way to contact your local union organisers. Yeah. And yay for Australia, Australian Union said, a union ticket. So there was all this kind of feedback on his industrial work practices. <laughs> but I suppose through his Twitter profile picture changing, you can guess that maybe that Deus Ex uh, game is going to come to a Tesla near you uh, pretty so. shortly. I think that's the theory. Mate, but, just um, for the record, I'm not sure we're going to be able to throw a picture up in the background, but if anyone wants to Google Elon back in his PayPal days, oh, there wasn't too much chisel and heroic about it, I've got, I've got to be honest. <laughs> there's a, yeah, I'm thinking of the same photograph you are, and it's pretty tragic. It is yeah. pretty tragic. Now, But what is not tragic is the Tesla share price. It has gone up to 7 181, nearly $782, and it was $705 last week. Now, that's because that earnings call where he was talking about fascism, stay-at-home uh, orders, etc., uh, was announcing the fact that they had a profitable quarter, um, and that, that's three profitable quarters for Tesla in a row. They've never been able to put together a 12-month period of profit, so they're, they're on the way to that. So that's why the share price has gone up. But the risk is that with Fremont closed for another month, it may put that in jeopardy. But um, that's what sent the, the share price upwards. Can, can I add my own little Musk watch for a moment, JC? Yep. I, I, I think, unless I'm mistaken, I think the Tesla Model 3 was the second best-selling car in Europe last month. Have you seen wow. that? Wow. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, well, I think it's right. <laughs> if it's wrong, <laughs> something will come up along the oh, Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, look, confidence, right? With that, we have reached the finish line. And I've got to say thank you, Mel. Thank you, James. And thank you, and Chester. Andrew. Thank you all. And thanks to our Undersecretary to the Podcast Production Subcommittee, Mr Pritchard, for his telepathic slider sliding, mouse clicking and dial twirling. Um, today, he's in a T-shirt saying, party like it's 1994 and you just got a PlayStation. A pair of MC Hammer's actual pants and wow. unicorn moccasins. It's, ama it's amazing. We're, that, we're having a look at the wardrobe earlier on. Please pass well on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at carsguide.com, well, comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an iTunes listener, please rate and review us. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, my mechanic says I have a preoccupation with vengeance. We'll see about that. <laughs> You've been nice though, too long, JC. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>